Well, good morning to you once again. It's a joy to see you this beautiful morning. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege, and I'm going to introduce you to two of my friends from Florence and their granddaughter, the Mays over here, and Miss Jim and Anita May, and Miss Anise. Did I get that right? And um, Miss Anita's mother is that one I told you about that loved to serve me asparagus sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we love them, and thank you for being here with us today. It's such a delight and such a joy to have friends show up in a worship service and, and, and be a part of what we are and what we do. Now, I want to invite you to Psalm 1 this morning. I want to invite you to Psalm 1. Any one of our senior adults could preach this message this morning because it's the secret to blessings from God. And they've lived it. They've experienced it. And so they could preach this. But I want us to read this passage together and I want us to see these wonderful words that God's given us. I'm not even promising that I'm going to finish this message this morning. But... Um, if I don't, we'll finish it tonight, and that'll be perfectly fine. The Scripture says the following, and I'm reading from New American Standard this morning. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, once again bless us. Bless the teaching and preaching of the Word this morning. Help us, Heavenly Father, to have the ability to articulate this message for the glory of God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I read recently of a particular man of God, a preacher, who walked into his church in his congregation. His secretary said to him as he came into the office, he said, Pastor, how you doing today? He says, I'm burdened, I'm burdened. And she looked at him, and the brightness in his eyes kind of betrayed him. And she said, you don't look burdened to me. He says, oh, I'm burdened. The Word of God tells us in Psalm 68, 19, that God daily loads us with benefits. And I've been loaded today with the blessings of God. It's such a burden to carry these great blessings. Folks, I want to talk to you today about the, how to be blessed by God. I want God to bless you today. I want you to understand understand these blessings of God uh, from, from the standpoint of Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is where it is divinely, strategically, by the Holy Spirit. It's the beginning of all that God wanted to teach the, the, His people about how to be blessed by God. And it's by no accident that when you open the book of Psalms, you find this one as its headstone, as the first thing, the entrance into all the rest of the Psalms that are written. And, and uh, this was one of the first things whenever they had their, their worships that they would, the worship services that the Jewish people would read. These words here. And so God's going to bless you. I promise you that. But now wait a minute. Before we can talk about that blessing, I have to tell you this morning that there's going to be a battle. And you see, there's always a battle. And I need you to understand this. And please listen to me very carefully. While all of us here want to be blessed by God, sometimes I fear that we forget about our old enemy, our old nature our old sinful nature, that 
that sinister being called self that sits there and demands attention to, 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 to what it desires and what it's looking for. Self is there and self gets on your, tries to climb back up on the throne. Before you knew the Lord Jesus, there sat self. And self did what self wanted, or so self thought, until you discovered that you were a slave to sin, that self really wasn't in charge, but sin was in charge. Because you see, hidden behind self is the sin nature. And there sat sin, telling self this and telling self that. And it created, it created for you a kingdom that you never wanted to be a part of. And God snatched you out of that kingdom when you came to Jesus and placed you in to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful that he did that? Now listen to me. The battle continues. The battle continues all the days of your life. It may be less now than it was you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago in some senses of the word, but the battle always continues as you learn victory and you go from victory to victory and you go from strength to strength and you go from grace to grace and you go from faith to greater faith. I'm telling you, the battle will always continue. It may be diminished here, but it's going to crop up in some other place in your life. It's always there and always always something that you're going to have to look at in your life. So, so let me tell you about this battle and let me show you the battleground first and foremost as we talk about the battle for the blessing. And then in this battleground that God's given us, it's right here in verse 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The battle the battleground is where you walk, it's where you stand, and where you sit. And I need to show you this over and over again, and I'm going to be terribly redundant. You ought to be used to that by now from me. But I want to build this foundation carefully for you this morning, and I want you to see this morning just how important this first verse is for you to understand the blessings of God, even if we don't finish even if you have to come back tonight to hear the rest of it, I want to make this very clear. I need you to see some things about your walk with the Lord and where the devil wants you to walk and where self wants you to walk. So I need you to go over for just a moment to a couple of, um, uh, of, of passages here. I want you to look at Proverbs 14. Hasn't been that too terribly long since we studied Proverbs 14 on Wednesday nights. And, and, I, and I want you to see I want you to see some things in here in Proverbs 14 and also in Proverbs 13. We're going to look at a couple of verses there and see something about our walk and see something about what happens with our lives. The Bible says this in Proverbs 14, 6, The scoffer fi seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge is easy to one who has understanding. And later in chapter tw uh, 13, verse 20, the scripture says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And that's in the New American Standard, as I told you this morning. So where you walk is very important, ladies and gentlemen. And blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Where you walk is very important because if you are a companion of fools, you're going to get hurt. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you there? Who you walk with is important. When I, uh, one of the first times I did a youth meeting uh, when I was just a young fella, younger uh, than I am now, much younger than I am now, I was sitting over there in Citronelle, Alabama, and I was teaching in Citronelle, and I drew a circle on the board, and I put a cross in that circle. And I said, let's let this cross represent the Lord Jesus Christ if we can. And let's let this circle represent the will of God. And Jesus is always there in the will of God. Amen? That's true. 
That's what God teaches us in His Word. Wherever you find Jesus, you find the will of God. And Jesus is always there in the will of God. I said, now, where do you need to be? I asked those young people. And they said, well, there where Jesus is. I said, very good. And I counted up how many young people we had, and I put those little red dots in there in that section. And I said, now, there you are, and there you are, and there you are. And I said, we're all here in the will of God. We're here with Jesus. I said, but now, wait a minute. You have friends that are not in the will of God. They're out here, aren't they? And I put some other dots of a different color out to the side there. And I said, there they are in that. What happens when they say, hey, let's go do thus and such, and they want to go this way when the will of God, when Jesus says, go that way? Which way do you go? And they sat there and they looked at me for a few moments and they said, well, you don't understand my friends. I said, oh, I don't need to understand your friends. What I need to understand is the will of God and where Jesus wants me to go. Because you see, the battle that you're always going to be facing within you is the fact that your friends are, that, that do not know Jesus Christ are never going to lead you in the same direction that Jesus will. And blessed is the man or the woman or the young person who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So where you walk is pretty important. But hold on, where you stand is pretty important as well. And back there in Proverbs again, in that Proverbs chapter 14, the Bible tells us this in Proverbs 14. It's a pretty amazing thing. Because the psalmist said, the psalmist said, Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners. In the pathway of sinners. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way, there's a path that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And you see, there's a path out there where you can stand that looks right, that sounds right, that according to the logic of the world is right, but I'm telling you, it's never right according to the logic of God's Word. And it's there. And where you stand will get you in trouble. The end of that is death, always. One of the amazing things I've tried to figure out... Y'all help me with this because maybe you, you, you have an answer that I don't have. But I've watched a lot of businessmen and businesswomen through the years, you know, in lots of different businesses, sales, insurance, doesn't matter. I've seen lots of businessmen out there who think they can compartmentalize their Christian life, but they call it a church life. And they have their Sunday life. But then here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, which is their normal work week, they don't mind standing in some questionable principles and some questionable ethics. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? And, and, they, and they don't especially mind that. And they, they get themselves into trouble because they have adopted this particular place to stand that seems right because it deals with business. But let me tell you, the end thereof is not a good place to be. And then thirdly, that battleground is where you sit. In the seat of the scoffers, the psalmist said... The Bible says a wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Now I need to explain these things, the walking, the standing, the sitting. I need to explain these things rather carefully. And I know I'm building a really deep and big foundation here for you to understand the blessings of God. But I believe this is necessary for us to be able to move on and really grasp the blessings of God. There, are, there, there is an action here. These verbs are action verbs and is talking about going from one thing to another 
to yet a third thing. And so the Lord says to us in this particular thing that he's walking in the, in the path in the counsel of the ungodly, he's standing in the path of sinful people, and yet then you see where he's sitting in the seat of the scoffers. And he sits in the seat. Of, what is that seat? Do you all know what that seat is? That seat, ladies and gentlemen, is the place of judgment. There was in the cities of Jerusalem a section where they had seats at the city gates. And as you came to a gate, you found there certain wise men known as judges. And those judges set up right there in the edge of the city <coughs> in order for you to... Yancey, would you go find me some water, please, sir? I started to tell you earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Set up right there in the city, and you come to them and you present your case to them. They are the experts in life. Experts, just ex an expert is a big drip under pressure, man. That's all in the world it is. And there they are, the experts in life. So the Lord is, the Lord is showing you a progress if you start listening to ungodly counsel. And then you get to the place where you adopt, you take a stand in a certain place, you adopt a certain lifestyle and eventually, you become what's known as a scoffer. You become an expert in those ways of ungodliness. And the Lord says, blessed is a man who doesn't do those things. Blessed is a man who is not seen as an expert in those particular areas. Now, I'm telling you this. If the devil can do it, he's going to break your stride so that you'll stand in that path. Get in that lifestyle. And if he can get you to stand still, he's going to make you an expert if he can. Blessed is the man who does not walk stand and sit in these places. The New Testament tells us that there is a place to sit, a place to walk, and a place to stand. Did y'all know that? The New Testament inverts all of this for us. When you get to the book of Ephesians, the New Testament tells you in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians that you have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. And once you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God seats you there with Christ in heavenly places. The New Testament tells you in Ephesians chapter 4 how to walk. It says, take off. The ungodly things. It's a word for removing clothing, dirty clothing. It says, take it off. Take off the ungodly things and put on these things. Take off anger and wrath and malice and envy and unforgiveness and selfishness and, and, and clamoring and bickering and gossiping and all these different things. Take it off. And put on the new man. And put on, clothe yourself with forgiveness and kindness and gentleness and goodness and all these other things. In fact, for the Ephesians, he told them, he said, hey, you've been stealing. Stop it. You know, he had all sorts of things that he shared in there. Hey, we're having regular fights on a regular basis. Thank you, kind sir. Cheers. <laughs> Allergies. All of these things before us that are found there. And, and, and he tells you where to take your stand. You see, I need you to understand something. The devil always twists the order. The order is, when you know Jesus, he puts you in a specific place in Christ, which is a place of victory, seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. 
And that's where he places you. And then he tells you how to live your life, what to do, your walk, the lifestyle that you need to have. But then he tells you where to take your stand, Ephesians chapter 6. And there in Ephesians 6, he says, you need, after you've done everything you need to do, you need to stand in the Lord. And that goes all the way back to that circle I drew with that cross in the middle of it. That there's where you need to stand. You need to stand in the Lord and you need to stand in the strength of His might. When he wrote Ephesians, he was writing to a church. Understand the book of Ephesians. The Ephesian people were a very spiritual people. Before, Jesus, before Paul ever showed up there telling the story of Jesus and winning these folks to the Lord Jesus Christ, there were things already at work. When you read in the book of Acts, chapter 19 and 20, right around in there, you're going to find out that the people, when they came to Jesus in Ephesus, they brought their books of witchcraft. And they burned their books of witchcraft in front of Paul and, 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 and Silas and, and, and uh, burned them and, and just had a big celebration right there. It was there that people, when they began baptizing folks, there in Ephesus where they began having them face four different directions when they baptized them. To the front, to the back, to the one side, to the other, north, south, east, and west, and renounce their relationship to the forces of evil each time they turned. And they made that part of their baptismal formula. Aren't you glad all we say is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? You know, because there they were, I renounce the forces of this God. I renounce this. I renounce the and, and so on and so forth. And they, they had to do this to break all ties to the pagan deities with whom they had uh, um, made an attachment. It was a very spiritual place. There were power encounters there of all kinds. And the Lord, the Lord shows us and tells us we have a greater source of strength in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we stand and we're blessed when we take our stand there in that place. Now I'm going to move on. I'm going to tell you about the basis for this blessing because I want you to grasp this and we'll, we'll close with this basis of the blessing and we'll finish this message tonight because uh, what we have to say for the last part of the verses, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 are, are very rich. I don't want you to miss it. But this one, the basis of the blessing is verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now the first thing I want to tell you about is the object of your delight. You see, if you're going to be blessed by God... The first thing you do is you, you, uh, you have victory, which is verse 1. But if you're going to be blessed by God, you need, to, you need to discover the object of your delight. You need to delight in something very specific. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, I'll show you something, folks. And... Um, you can find it in the Baptist record, but I went online and got some of the more original sources to talk about it and, and share with you. And, and, and I've got some things in front of me here. I guess I could do that Rush Limbaugh thing you hear him do on the microphone when he, you know, aggravates you with his papers and stuff. And uh, this is by Gary Burge. And he's a professor at Wheaton of New Testament. And he's talking about biblical illiteracy in America. And we're not talking about the rest of the world. We're talking about America this morning. And one of the things that he mentions there, he's talking about the secular culture, which they don't know anything. There's no biblical foundation whatsoever. You can ask Jeremy up there, you know, running our video camera this morning. But you'll, you, when we go over to USM, when our young people are over there and they're sharing their faith over there and they're asking them, you know, questions about God and about heaven 
religion and the Bible and this sort of thing, those guys, most of them that they come in touch with, don't know anything about Scripture. They have no clue whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's true today. Well, he's talking about that. He said there's ample evidence that points to similar trends in the churches. In the churches. One third could not put in the following put the in the following in order. Abraham, the Old Testament prophets, the death of Christ and Pentecost. They couldn't put that in order. Half of the people surveyed could not sequence the following. Moses in Egypt, Isaac's birth, Saul's death, and Judah's exile. One third could not identify Matthew as an apostle from a list of New Testament names. When asked to locate the biblical book of uh, supplying a given story, they couldn't find Paul's travels in Acts. They didn't know Christmas story was in Matthew. And half did not know the Passover story was in the book of Exodus. They didn't know that. But wait a minute. That's just the mainline churches. Let's go to the Baptist churches for a minute. Let's talk about us, all right? Only 34% of Baptists believe that Satan's real. Hello? Did I miss something there? Only 43% believe that works don't earn heaven. That means 57% believe that you do good works to get to heaven. Baptist. Most Baptists affirm that Christ was sinless. I'm glad they got that right. <laughs> but I said most. That means a majority. You want to hear the number? 55%. 45% of Baptists believed Jesus was sinful. Sixty-six percent believe the Bible's totally accurate. Baptists. That means 34% question, Baptists, question the Word of God. Is that sad? He's got more about, um, Mr. Burge does, and Barna, because he relies on Barna's information. He has more on non-denominational churches, assemblies of God, and other denominations as well that are in here. But the point is this, folks, your delight, the object of your delight, if you're going to be blessed by God, is the Word of God. You must delight in the Word of God. But wait a minute, I can't stop there because there's an action that you need to take. There's something you must do in this verse of Scripture. Not only should you delight in it, there's something you must do. And in His law, He meditates day and night. Hello, you need to read the Word of God. You need to be studying and learning the Word of God. Well, pastor, I'm at church on Sunday morning. Isn't that enough? No. I come Sunday morning and Sunday night. Isn't that enough? No. Well, I'm there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and I hear you teach. Isn't that enough? No. Do you eat three meals a week? Is that all you eat in a week's time? I'm looking out amongst you. Some of you, it's possible you may only eat three meals a week. But most of you, I seriously doubt you only eat three meals a week. Some of you probably eat more than three meals a day. Hello. I'm sorry, I'm leaving now. <laughs> We want to be blessed by God, but we don't even delight in His Word. If we, as a church, are to see the blessings of God, then we as a church have to become a church in love 
with the Word of God. That's why our mission statement says that we, we, we love the Lord Jesus with all of our heart. We teach everything that Jesus says. We are very quick to obey what Jesus says. And then we reach out to others. That's why that's there. It's very intentional. We need to be people of the book. And if we're not, we're in trouble. We're in serious trouble. Fall in love with the Word of God. In His law, He meditates day and night. And just to give you a small taste of tonight, then when you meditate day and night in the Word of God, when you have a regular diet of the Word of God, God fixes you and God blesses you. He promises to do so. But wait, don't put your books up yet. It only begins by knowing Jesus. Knowing Him. It only begins there. And so this morning, if you don't know Jesus, I have to point you to the cross. I've mentioned Jesus a lot of times this morning, but I have to point you to the cross. I have to point you past the cross to the empty tomb. I have to point you to the throne of heaven because Jesus is Lord. And I have to point you there. He's risen. He's the living Lord. And He wants to be Lord here in your heart. And you have to know Him there. He has to be your Savior and your Lord. Father, bless us this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you continue to minister to us and to teach us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you show us in your Word how to have these blessings and these victories that you promised to us. Lord, we want to be a church that blesses but we also want to be blessed by you. So we seek your face right now. And when you ask you to call us out, make your name glorious in our midst. If you were here last week, your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed. You know what a glorious day it was and how wonderful and how meaningful. Not just because it was Resurrection Sunday, but celebrating so many people who obeyed God and were baptized as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe that's your case this morning. Maybe you followed Jesus, but you've never obeyed Jesus through baptism. And if that's the case, then this morning I want you to make your way down where I am. And I want you to tell me, I'm a Christ follower. I follow Jesus. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus. But I've never been baptized as a believer in the Lord Jesus. And I want you to be obedient this morning. If God's placed it on your heart, this is your place to serve Him. And you've never put your membership here. If it's in another Baptist church, you would come by transfer of letter if it's in another church of like faith we'll talk to you about that and perhaps receive you by statement depending on the church but we want to see you obey God today and there you'll be blessed and Lord do bless us and Lord speak to our hearts in Jesus name Amen. Softly and tenderly, we stand to our feet and do business with God.
Bye. Come here, Jim. Please, sir. Mr. James Chadwick comes this morning telling us he's a believer in the Lord Jesus, but he's never followed the Lord in baptism. And he wants to be baptized as a part of this fellowship here at 38th Avenue. What's the mind of the church? Amen? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Well, I'm going to tell you something that's probably not a secret. We've prayed for you for quite a while now. <laughs> we certainly have. And uh, we're glad that you're here. How many are you going to pray for this guy? Great. Good. Oh, my Lord. Listen to that. Come on down here. See here? I want. Come on, Mama. Come on. Let's just get on down here and let's have the whole family down here together this morning. And uh, we're going to make this a great uh, celebration. In just a moment, you're going to come by and receive them. We've got to receive an offering first, so you all get to sit down here in the front for just a minute while we do our, receive our offering. And then you'll come by and give Brother Jim a right hand of fellowship, all right? Come on. Come on, ushers, if you would, please. Thank you. Join me as we pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you at this time just praising your name for what you continue to do in our church. And Lord, we're thankful for how you're touching lives and changing lives. And Father, we just praise your name for that. Father, we ask that you be with us as individuals that we truly might be that bold witness that we need to be. Father, help us to be concerned about those around us and give us that burden for lost souls, Father. Father, we thank you for our church and our leadership, and we pray that you continue to lead us and direct us. And Father, as we come to this time of returning our tithes and offerings, we ask that you just take them and bless them in a very special way. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
ready to come and stand down front here. We're going to stand in, to our feet and we're going to have our our benediction song in this moment. But uh, before we do, I just want to remind you that our college students are are out and about. They went to Gulf Shores for a retreat. Um, they didn't invite me. They said they didn't want to look at me down there. And uh, anyway, they've gone down there and they uh, have been involved down there and hopefully we'll be back this evening sometime. Pray for their safety on their way back, if you would please. And um, pray that the Lord will bless them. Now, we're going to sing something, right? You got something for us? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Amen. Amen. 